5,000 kilometers on snow, ice, gravel, mud, and tarmac. From 20 degrees below to 40 above. At breakneck speed every meter of the way. The teams and drivers wring every last scrap of performance out of their million euro cars. Walking a knife edge between overcautious and over the edge. This is what it takes to become World Rally Champions. But for one top team, this year is not just going to be a battle for glory, they face a fight for survival. Championship is big money motorsport, second only to Formula One. For the car manufacturers who spend tens of millions to take part, only the winners really see the benefits. Three out of six big name manufacturers pulled out of the sport last year. Some are now wondering if Subaru could be next. The team has enjoyed enormous success in the past, but it's three years since their last championship title and the pressure for success is now greater than ever. This is the story of one extraordinary year with the Subaru World Rally Team. It's going to be a hell of a season. It's the final day of testing for the team's new car before the first rally of the season at Monte Carlo in just three weeks' time. The team is fine-tuning a new version of the Imprezza World Rally car that has evolved over the last 12 years. They've redesigned hundreds of components and spent months testing all over Europe in a search for improved performance. At the centre of everything, as always, is their star driver, Norwegian Petter Solberg. Petter's one of the top three drivers in the world. A millionaire, a perfectionist, and a workaholic. For me, motorsport is 24 hours a day. I'm loving it and this is everything for me. It actually comes before my family and I know it. It's not nice to say, but that's how it is. Over hundreds of kilometers of testing, Petter's feedback has been a crucial part of improving this year's new car. And he's hoping that it's gonna turn around his fortunes. Petter was world champion with Subaru in 2003. Since then, a combination of mistakes, technical problems and bad luck has left him trailing his rivals. We have had too much bad luck, but this year it's our yeah, We're going to be world champion and I think everybody is going to work very hard to, to get it back again. Back in England, Petter's team boss is a man equally obsessed with winning. Since the team began in 1989, David Latworth has made the Subaru brand synonymous with success in rallying. To get value out of a motorsport programme, you need to be seen to be winners. You don't have to win every rally, yeah? but you have to keep your strike rate such that you're always perceived to be in the frame, you're always perceived to be a leading team. David has a budget of 50 million euros a year and the facilities of one of Britain's biggest motorsport companies at his disposal. Today, he's getting the latest reports from testing. He spent five million euros of last year's budget on developing the new car, so he's anxious that it will deliver results. Down in the workshops, his mechanics are more worried about simply getting the new car ready in time. Well, we'll have to solve somewhere. Re the three cars for Monte Carlo are due to be shipped out by the end of the day. 
But John McLean, chief technician on Petter's car, is having a parts crisis. There are lots of small components and bits and pieces that we're waiting on. Um, and it's slowly coming together. I mean, everybody, the, every department is, is flat out to, to get the bits to us. With just hours to go until those empty trucks outside need to be loaded and hit the road, this car is missing something rather vital. Its engine. So how does one of the world's biggest and most successful rally teams find itself in a race just to get to the start line? The survival of a world rally team depends more than anything else on their ability to turn one of these into one of these. The rules state that world rally cars must be based on a current model four-seater road car and that at least 25,000 of them must have been built for sale. It's this close relationship between the road car and the rally car that makes it so worthwhile for Subaru to spend 50 million euros a year of their marketing budget on their rally team. <laughs> They're both high-performance, four-wheel drive cars, but the difference between a sports saloon car and a world rally car is reflected in their price tags. To really appreciate the differences, you need the help of a top professional driver. 26-year-old Chris Atkinson is Australia's hottest young rally driver. This year he'll be fighting for a permanent place with the Subaru team, which has a reputation for turning young drivers into world champions. So what do you get for 40 grand? First, you get a turbocharged 2.5 litre, 300 horsepower engine. You get reliability, ABS, traction control, four-wheel drive and a nice stereo. My mum had a WRX when I was at school and it used to be quite cool to turn up in that and all the other the guys would be, uh, be jealous of that. And Chris can do a lap of this three-kilometre test track in one minute, 38 seconds. So, what do you get for 630,000 euros? First, a secret weapon called launch control. We don't have to use the clutch, it automatically engages and we can just take off straight away um, and it manages the level of grip and controls the slip. Which means it starts like a rocket. Five, four, three, two, one. It makes the road car look like your granny's driving. I think the starts in these things are the most impressive. You touch the throttle and it's just gone. The rally car has a standard Subaru Boxer engine, rebuilt to racing specs, optimised for torque and acceleration rather than top speed. So that rocket thrust is available whenever you want it. And that's where you make time in rallying. You need the torque to respond between the corners and then you can, can push. Uh -huh. And those little short bursts of speed is where the time comes. You also get a 100,000 euro semi-automatic gearbox, which can change gear in 10 milliseconds. Add to that racing suspension, weight reduction, tyres that cost 700 euros a piece, and you've got a car that sticks to tarmac like glue, and tears up this track a massive eight seconds quicker than the road car. And of course, it can also do this, this, this. So, in their quest to extract every last scrap of performance out of every single component, these guys will always use every last day, hour and minute available to fine-tune their machinery before each rally. But if you're not in it, you can't win it. Fourteen hundred kilometers away, temperatures are dropping. Snow is falling, and the stage is set for one of the oldest and most challenging rallies in the world. Rally has evolved since the first Monte Carlo rally. 
In 1911, 20 motoring enthusiasts had up to seven days to reach Monaco from six different start points. In the 1920s, the first high-speed time runs, called stages, were introduced to help decide the winner. Before long, professional drivers started wrecking the time stages before events, which led to the invention of pace notes. Easy right. Dead straight for about 400 yards. Hairpin. Navigators became co-drivers and thanks to pace notes and steadily improving car and engine design, speeds rocketed. After some nasty accidents with the infamous Group B cars of the 1980s, the World Rally Championship now has a tight technical formula designed to restrict power to 300 horsepower and keep the spectacle within safe limits. This year's Monte Carlo Rally includes 366 kilometers of time stages over three days. The drivers must also complete 970 kilometers of road sections between the stages and the main base, service park in Monaco. It's two days before the rally begins and the tension is mounting. Welcome to Monte Carlo. The cars have arrived and the team is setting up its service area. Engineering rooms, workshops, hospitality tents, kitchens with food, spares, computers, cables, lighting, everything they could possibly need for a weekend of rallying. Their big rivals are within easy spying distance. As are 41 privateer teams, varying in size and budget from quite professional to one man and his hatchback. After months of preparation, it's finally time to unveil the new car. And this year's lineup of drivers. Petter and Chris are joined by French driver Stefan Sarazan. Another young talent hoping to make it to the top level with Subaru. He's got four rallies with the team this year to prove what he can do. For me, it's the second year with Subaru. So it's fantastic for me, big opportunity, and uh, I know the car, I know the mechanics, engineer, so it's, uh, it's very good. Thursday morning sees the team up in the mountains for shakedown. An important four-hour practice session before the rally begins tomorrow. The drivers will do multiple runs on a time 10 kilometer stage to prepare themselves and their cars for the unique challenges of this rally. The temperatures typically are just around zero and the difference of a couple of degrees can be massive between the stage being dry and damp or being icy and uh, you know, treacherous. And of course if it snows uh, and it catches you out, you could be on completely the wrong tyre and lose minutes. The Monty is run on tarmac roads, but in the blink of an eye, they can change from dry to wet to ice or even snow. Four different surfaces that demand different driving techniques, different suspension settings, and different tyres. It's going to be a mad, bad 350 kilometre charge down narrow alpine roads. Make a mistake and you face either a stone wall or a massive drop off a cliff. All this makes the Monty an extreme test of man and machine. Petr is slow on his first run. Difficult conditions, incredible. So much ice around and this morning it was actually just wet uh, in the morning. Then it's turned around to be a full ice so you can never trust uh, these conditions here in the mountains in Monte Carlo. 
After each run, the drivers and engineers get together to discuss improvements they can make to the car. Really slippy up there. It's, uh, it's almost sheet ice everywhere. So they're really struggling for a grip and traction. So we've gone a lot softer and uh, we're going to see if it works. everybody. That's, that's how the feeling of confidence is. Confidence and traction, that's the main thing. If you don't have the full confidence, you lose a hell of a lot of time, but we're doing uh, some big steps here now. Most important will be Petter's tyre choice for each set of stages. Thanks to the wildly unpredictable conditions, the teams are allowed a wider range of different tyre designs here than at any other rally. For the ice, there's a special winter tyre, which can be fitted with metal studs around the edge. For wet or slushy conditions, there's a heavily grooved intermediate tyre. For dry tarmac, they're slicks. These have lighter grooves, leaving as much rubber as possible in contact with the road. But whatever tyre you choose, it's going to be a compromise. We have to think slick or intermediate. Maybe too much, no? I think, yeah. Sooner or later, the drivers will face dry tarmac on winter tyres or black ice on slicks. Monte Carlo has everything. Snow, ice, gravel, tarmac, dry, wet, everything. And normally, we have the wrong tyres. Petter has retired here three times out of five attempts. But this year, he's determined not to get left behind by his two main championship rivals. The favourite is current world champion, Frenchman Sebastian Loeb. He's driving a Citroën Zara run by the Belgian Kronos team. Loeb loves Monte Carlo. He's won here three times in four attempts. But he's playing down his chances. You can't compare with the other cars. Everyone puts other pneus. Everyone tries to do many things. So we don't have a lot of reference. For us, it's going. I hope it goes well for us. Petter's other main rival is flying Finn, Marcus Gronholm. It's the former champion's first rally for Ford, and he's liking his new car. I'm really optimistic and what, what we can do with the car, so it feels good. Of the big three, Gronholm is the fastest in the shakedown. But tomorrow will be the true test of how the rivals compare. The teams head back to Monaco to analyse their data and finalise their strategy for the first stages of the rally. For the moment, it's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. the best guess yeah. that we can make. I don't think we need to make it. So, sit, so we know Citroën Pichu had the full start inside today. Mm -hmm. But the first run, after my opinion, was more actually full start. The the, the anyway, we will, we'll, we'll make that decision obviously in the morning. Yeah, just to see the, the trend At the Subaru one. team meeting, Petter would happily debate tyre choices all night. We want. There's no more discussion because obviously we can get the guys all packed up. And, uh, but with 20 years of World Rally experience, David is very much in charge of strategy and he won't be deciding anything until the overnight weather reports come in. We're ready, we're ready yeah. to have the, the, the meeting in the morning at 6.20. Yep. <coughs> well on it. In two and a half hours' time, the team will get their first chance to see how their new car matches up to their rivals. First test of the year, a lot of new things, so we have to make sure that everything works. It will work. But first, David must now decide what tyres to give his drivers for the first set of three stages. We're getting the weather reports back from the stages that say they're in quite nice condition. There's, there's a little bit of ice and frost around and so on, um, but they are perhaps drier and uh, uh, cleaner of ice and snow than you would have expected 48 hours ago. The first three stages are some of the highest in the rally. They're also 77 kilometers away, a two hour drive. It was six o'clock in the morning when those reports were all made. Uh, we have to make the tyre choice at 6.30 um, and the cars don't go into the stages for at least another couple of hours. All the teams spy on each other to find out what tyres their rivals are using. So David already knows that Loeb is going out on studded winter tyres. 
but he's decided to gamble on a more ambitious strategy for his star driver. He's putting Petta on slick tyres. The idea is that across all three stages, Petter will be able to gain more time on the long dry sections than he loses on the icy patches. David's gambling on what exactly happens with the weather over the next two hours as the drivers make their way into the mountains. With just 10 minutes to go before the first stage is due to start, there's a problem. Go ahead, Phil, over. The road is completely blocked uh, for about one and a half days uh, after the start. Uh, there's no way of making on time. Petter and his co-driver, Phil Mills, are stuck in traffic and are struggling to get to the start of the stage on time. It seems that the Monte Carlo rally is too popular for its own good. Sebastian Loeb gets the Monte Carlo rally underway. <laughs> 13 minutes behind schedule, Petter's up next. Five, four, three, two, one. The team follows Petter's progress with a GPS tracking system. They can compare his times every few kilometers with his rivals. Petter's really struggling. Since dawn, the temperatures actually dropped and a harsh frost has made the stage extremely icy. Loeb makes light work of it on his studded tires. Petter has to tiptoe on his slicks. This is full ice all the way up through the headpins. Petter finishes the stage 11th, which turns out to be equal last place. The traffic problems meant that only 11 cars made it to the first stage. The other 42 entrants have been sent back to Monaco and awarded Petter's time. Petter now needs much drier conditions for his tyre strategy to pay off. 6.56, Carlo. On stage two of the Monte Carlo rally, Subaru's Petter Solberg already has two minutes to make up. The stage is drier, but not dry enough. This time, Gronholm is fastest on intermediate tyres. Petter's still struggling. David's slick tyre gamble is misfiring badly. We underestimated just how frosty it would get, and our choice was too optimistic, so we lost a little bit of time in there. Stage three is looking much drier. Petter can now push hard and try to get back some of that lost time. Or can he? La Special 3, LT annulé. They decided to cancel the stage three because there were only 11 cars in the rally. Yeah. Why didn't they cancel two then? Yeah, I know they should have, but... Well, the cancelled stage turns a bad tyre choice okay. into a disaster. That's the way they're thinking. Mm. That's why I wanted to do to the yeah. But David's not giving up. He's putting in an official protest. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's helping us, though, Phil. Just what, we, what we're trying to prove to them is the only fair thing to do is to cancel the times from one and two. By the time the drivers get back to Monaco, the dust has settled. Petter and Phil get the verdict. Subaru's protest has been rejected. You can imagine how annoyed we are. We dropped so much time on the first two, which we knew we were going to do, and then take it all back again in stage three. So the, the plan was working perfectly, uh, but then it was cancelled, so it's quite a big mess now. At lunchtime service, the team is allowed 30 minutes to work on each car. While Petter checks in with the bosses. Let's put from the 100% ice the whole stage. David and his engineers need a new tyre strategy for this afternoon's three stages. Lewis Moyer is on his bike, spying on Ford and Kronos, all part of his role as sporting director. We can see what Marcus does. We can see what Marcus does. 
maybe not Chris. Or... Hi, Lewis. Slick. Slick. OK, thank you. This time, David's going more cautious than his rivals. He needs Petter to get his confidence back, so he's giving him intermediates. Back in the mountains, the local gendarme have cleared the roads, and the full field of 53 cars is finally unleashed. Extra, extra long, 18. Petter's confidence returns. He can finally start pushing and working his way back up the field. He's on the pace, the new car feels great, Petter is back in the groove. But the final stage of the day brings more drama. He stopped. He stopped in the early car at the stage. It's not moved. No, no the, yellow, the yellow hasn't moved, so... It was odds on that at least one driver would get caught out on the ice today. But no one dreamed it would be this one. He won't be getting out of there in a hurry. Is it April the 1st? Rally teams don't normally celebrate each other's misfortunes, but with Sebastian Loeb, they make an exception. We're getting quite excited, because Sebastian Loeb never stops. Maybe once a year. And now he's done on the first event of this year, and that's good. He, he went off in a very icy, or something, icy braking. It's terrible conditions now. I, I really hate this. I have been like, driving like my grandmother. Loeb's crash leaves Gronholm leading the rally. Second fastest on the final stage puts Petter up to seventh overall. But the biggest shock of the day comes from a Monte Carlo rookie. Going with the safest tyre choice all day has put Chris Atkinson in second place. He can't quite believe it himself. It's not bad, Petter did a 15 17. <laughs> The 75 kilometer drive back to Monaco is officially part of the rally. It must be driven at normal road speeds, but there's a time limit. Loeb Citroen is going to be late. But it's not all over yet. So called super rally rules mean that if the car can be repaired, Loeb can take a five-minute time penalty and rejoin the rally tomorrow. The rally is not finished, the champion is not plus, certainly not, it's long, everything is possible, we can go up, go up very high, it's a great challenge that we've fixed, well, everything is possible. Meanwhile, Subaru now have problems of their own. Petter stopped at the side of the road with a leak from his oil cooler. <sighs> He and Phil have just 40 minutes to fix the leak and drive over 40 kilometers back to Monaco. For every minute they're late, they'll get a time penalty. Just like how long we got to work on it. He's got, he's got, a, he's got a half an hour to work on it. The team can't go out and help him. All they can do is apply their brains and their computers to the problem. How can you buy plastic yeah. pipes completely? Yeah. Like what about at the bottom? What can you do? They the come from the bottom. The sandwich plate. Plate. What can you do? Maybe from you drill out two pipes at the top of the ALS pipe, like the Jubilee clip. You will lose it. Your cooler won't go straight to the block. No. Emergency surgery seems possible. You can do this. You can do it or not. No, it's it accesses are. See, see what he's doing. Right? No, he wants to see, see what he's doing. Petter and Phil are instructed how to use a piece of piping to bypass the leaking oil cooler. If once you've got that clip on, you need to make sure those hoses are not going to hit the... It's a risky operation. If the emergency bypass doesn't work, the engine could drain of oil and be permanently damaged. But it's a risk that David would rather take than recovery and a five-minute penalty. Remind yourself, because it could blow oil. There's now less than half an hour to get back to Monaco. Good, good rev. No no, don't worry. Okay. Well, there's no point then. He might as well retire. Because if he doesn't drive at a good speed, he's not going to get back oh, yeah. in time. David needs Petter to drive flat out to make it back on time. What's the average he needs to make for this? 47 kilometers. 47 kilometers. Uh, we just need to not wreck the engine. So yeah, yeah, yeah. With five minutes, wrecking the engine. I know, I know. Petter must keep one eye on the road and the other on his oil pressure. Then he's just got to drive on the oil light. The minute the oil light comes on, just forget it. 
lost oil pressure and stopped again. It hasn't, no, it hasn't got any oil pressure. The engine stopped and it's over. They've used all their spare oil, so there's no point in trying to fix the car again. It will have to be recovered. Oh, you tried your best. Let's see. Give us one minute. We can do it when you're back. Okay. Uh, some of that shot of you. Now, Petra and Phil will have to take a penalty. Maybe worse. There's obviously a risk that that's done some damage to the engine. We won't know till we get the car back here, which will be another hour or so. If it needs an engine replacement, which we're not allowed to do within the regulations, then we'll have to retire the car and that's the end of Petter's rally. Two hours later, Petter's car is finally back at the service park. Now the team can see for themselves what went wrong. The oil cooler has a crack where the oil leaked. It looks like a straightforward oil leak. Yeah. We just have to hope that it's not done any damage to the engine. The cooler can be replaced. It's going to be much harder to work out if the engine has sustained damage because the rules don't allow it to be opened up. We can look inside the engine through the spark plug hole and see there's no problem in the top there. We can also poke around and, and look around uh, from the bottom end. Um, we can't get into the engine, so we can't check things like bearings and so on, but we can refill the engine with oil, change the oil filter and everything, start it up and see if all the oil pressure data looks normal. And if it is, we've got a good chance of carrying on. It's an agonising wait for Petter and his engineer. I will uh, get the phone, from, uh, phone call from the team later and I think they have to work very hard with the car to see what they can do anyway, but hopefully they can sort it out, but uh, I think it's maybe a little bit difficult yeah. Eventually the diagnosis is announced. Uh, the engine's completely seized, so we can't change the engine. You can't pull it apart to have a look or do anything, so no, that's the end of the rally for that car. Hold on. We'll retire the car. We won't be continuing. OK. So I send the paperwork down to uh, the control. OK. It's a depressing end to a roller coaster first day of the season. After a massive push to get the new car ready, two risky decisions. He's got to move within the next five minutes to stay in the rally. And two bits of bad luck have spoiled the Monte Carlo party for Subaru. It's the worst possible start to their Big Stars World Championship campaign. And Petter's fourth Monte Carlo retirement. I can't believe it. Every year. The Subaru team are no strangers to just how cruel motorsport can be. But they know how to bounce back. Petter's misfortune has created a wonderful opportunity for the team's two young drivers. For the rest of this rally, these guys have a rare chance to steal the limelight and maybe secure themselves a future in the team. Chris is David's current favourite. He's been guaranteed a drive in 11 rallies this season. And second place after day one has hugely impressed the boss. Stefan, with just four rallies this season, has got his work cut out to get hired for next year ahead of Chris. This morning they face a much tougher challenge than yesterday. Warmer temperatures means that slick tyres are the only competitive option. But there's still plenty of ice around. Every corner you go around, you go out of the, out of the sunshine, the grip changes dramatically. Stefan had a taste of this on Friday morning, so he's got an opportunity to make up time on his teammate, who's very much as slick tyres on ice virgin. Chris is enjoying the challenge, 
but the team isn't enjoying his times. In one stage, he's already slipped to fourth place. Well, that's the first time I've been on a slick on ice ever, so uh, still learning, but the time wasn't bad. This is Stefan's chance to take over his favourite son. his groove. His times are even a match for rally leader Gronholm. Over three stages, he's over a minute faster than his teammate. Back at service, Stefan's star performance has won favour with the team's inner circle. He's made it a very positive morning for the new car, and David even sniffs a possible podium finish. You were like five seconds faster than most of the guys. Very good. This afternoon, the Monte Carlo ice skating challenge will reach its climax. Still on slicks, the drivers must face the snowbound summit of the famous Col de Turini. The fans flock here every year to witness the inevitable carnage. Keep left of a crest, double caution. No, no, early Last year, the Coles list of high profile victims included both Petter and Marcus Gronholm. So David's determined that his new favourite road warrior is mentally prepared for the challenge. To the, top, yeah. the way you drove yesterday yeah, on the ice was perfect. I know, no, no, but, but still. The yeah, philosophy yeah, 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 yeah. is the same. Slow, careful, in slowly, yeah. come out on the right line. You know what that so means? It's clear, it's clear, it's clear. snow? It's no, 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 clear. Ah, okay. no, no snow until the top. <laughs> With Petter on the sidelines, Stefan's getting a taste of what it's like to be a top team's number one driver. Petter knows very well. Mmm, pressure. Stefan's on a roll. 16 seconds faster than Chris on stage 10 and takes his place overall. But he's no longer satisfied with just beating his teammate. He's setting his sights much higher. It's difficult to go very fast and uh, I will try to, to push more on the next one. We will see. Stefan starts the ascent to the Col de Turini, determined to prove he can drive like a champion. It's a long climb to the 1,600 metre summit. Then the fun begins. These conditions can really reduce world champions to granny pace. fools out of others. Loeb's teammate, Xavier Pons, entertains the crowds with a whole series of spins. Chris is cautious, determined to keep it on the road, but he's torturously slow. <laughs> Stefan's driving like an old pro. <laughs> fast on the ice, fast on the snow, he's third fastest on the stage and up to fifth overall. Now he's really put his teammate in his place, beating Chris by a minute and 30 seconds on that final stage. Being cautious on your Monte Carlo debut is fine, but dropping from second to six in one day is not doing Chris's reputation or his confidence any favours. And this afternoon we're just too cautious on the training stage. Everyone was warning about how tricky it was and, and then you just be, it's easy to be too cautious and just throw away time. Sunday morning brings an opportunity for Chris to fight back. Colder stages means a return to winter tyres. Chris can get his confidence back and prove that he too has what it takes. He beat Stefan by 16 seconds on the first stage. Five right over for the... It's game on.
On the final day of the Monte Carlo Rally, Subaru team rivals Chris and Stefan are fighting for their World Rally futures. 30. Pushing each other faster and faster through the morning's last two stages. It's good news for the team, this duel is making Subaru look good. All right, minus off camera. Back at service, David's seen enough. The afternoon's final three stages are his last chance to play the tyre choice game. Chris gets to stay on winter tyres. But David has a new challenge for Stefan. You could just take WX no stud, <coughs> but it doesn't seem much point. There is a lot of down like that, basically. No, no, no. If you wanted to do something interesting, you go on and it. Can I show you what I mean? What do you see? On Earth, sorry. No money, you're all right, so. All right. He's done his maths and worked out that with intermediate tyres, there's still a slim chance of Stefan taking fourth or even third place, but it's going to be very risky. Very difficult. In places, it'll be very difficult. The gamble with that, of course, is we stand to gain in the dry sections something like a minute and a half. Yeah? But on the icy sections, we will lose something, normally we'd say 10 seconds per kilometre. So overall, the balance looks faster to go on the uh, intermediate tyre. But you, you gain those 20 seconds at quite a high level of risk. Stefan can see pain, but not too much gain. Yeah, but you don't want to lose a place? No, 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 no. no you, oh, you won't lose a place. You'll, you'll lose everything or nothing. <laughs> That's what I'm saying to you. The, 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 from a performance point It's a tricky dilemma. Stefan needs to be sure he wins his battle with Chris. It's just a slush you have to watch out. But he also needs to prove to the boss that he can be a team player. Okay, you happy with that? <laughs> I don't want to be six or seven. No, no, no. Yeah. no I'm joking. Team player it is. Stefan's car is fitted with intermediates. It's a very tense, icy stage 16 for Stefan. He needs to bide his time here and not throw away his weekend's work. He loses 25 seconds to Chris, but he's safely through. Now Stefan has to shine. And he delivers. Here's a man fighting for his place in the team and giving it his all. Second fastest on the stage, he makes back all the time. on the final run through the Col de Torini, he takes another 20 seconds from his teammate. I just want to say well done, boys, and uh, thank you very much. Hello. And uh, some valuable points there. Hello. So what we look forward to seeing you both in service, over. It's not enough to take fourth place, but Stefan's delivered exactly what was required. He's made his boss look smart. It's worked out pretty much as we predicted the calculations of you know time gain time loss and so on through the stage were just about spot on meanwhile on the final stage world champion sebastian Loeb completes an amazing recovery to second place despite that five minute penalty finishing only a minute behind gronholm ford celebrate a victory for their new driver on his maiden run Chris has brought his car safely home in sixth. He threw away his second place, but it's still a good result on his Monte Carlo debut. In fifth, Stefan's beaten Chris here and proved he's a team player. But has he done enough? He now has just three more rallies this year to prove to the team that he and not the young Australian should be their number two. By the end of the season, one of these drivers will be hired, the other fired. But from tomorrow, that will be top of David's priority list. There's that mixed feeling of, you know, pleased for these two guys what they've done and slightly frustrated that Petter didn't get the chance to show what he could do. In just 10 days' time, the team face a very different challenge. The very cold and very fast rally of Sweden. David needs Petter to get on a charge find out just how fast their new car really is and get his world championship campaign back on track.